How are you all doing today? Okay. Um, I realized after uh, one of you guys emailed me um, that I had not put up, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, the video for today, um, which that won't be that big of a deal because all we're covering today is the um, review of complex numbers. Uh, and so best case scenario, that's going to be like 15 minutes uh, of talking about stuff before we jump into the in-class assignment. Um, but I'll get all of the videos uploaded for everything we have to do up until exam three um, today so that, that won't happen again. I thought I had already done that, but apparently I just put up all the videos until exam two. So it is what it is. Um, all right. So let's talk about complex numbers. Um, and hopefully this is all largely a review. Um, but if not, it's not too wildly complicated anyway. Um, and for the most part, if you don't have a TI-30, um, your calculator can do 90% of it. Um, and so we're going to learn how to, to manipulate some things by hand today um, because some of the derivations that I'll do will require it. But for the most part, um, the expectation on you guys is to be able to just actually use your calculators effectively uh, to solve uh, basic. All right. So complex numbers. Complex numbers have multiple forms. Uh, and the first one that we're going to be dealing with is what's called the rectangular form. Excuse me. So in a rectangular form, a complex number, which I'm going to denote by putting a bar over the top of my variable here. So I could say that a complex number A would be little a plus jb, where a is the real part of complex number A, and b is the, re, uh, excuse me, the imaginary part of complex number A. So a complex number is simply a real number and an imaginary number added together. Uh, most of you are probably familiar with the imaginary operator i, uh, where i is equal to the square root of one. Because we're in electrical engineering and i is utilized for current constantly, we can't do that. So j, this guy right here, is going to be equal to the square root of negative one. So it's the exact same thing as the i you learned about in your math class. So I want to be clear about that. So we're not introducing anything new. We're just giving it a slightly different symbol to make it confusing. Um, so if I were to plot a complex number on well, what I'll call a complex plane, <coughs> excuse me, where my x-axis is my real axis and my y-axis is my imaginary axis, then A plus JB, and I'm just going to assume here that A and B are both positive numbers. Uh, no, get rid of that Dropbox crap. It looks something like this, where the projection onto the real axis is A, and the projection onto the imaginary axis is B. And we can see pretty easily that our complex number forms an angle, which I'll call theta A, with the real axis, and that also has some magnitude, which I'll just call capital A with no bar over it. So it's the scalar representation. Uh, and this leads us to our exponential form and our polar form. And these are equivalent forms, just giving us the information in a slightly different way. So the polar form, uh, excuse me, exponential form first. Looks like 
uh, complex number A is magnitude A multiplied by E to the J theta A. And our polar form, which is what we'll use most of the time, or at least what's used most of the time in electrical engineering, our complex number A is simply expressed as magnitude A angle theta A. So it's got the exact same information. It's, uh, the polar form is just a shorthand notation. Um, so it'll be useful if we can convert back and forth between these. So based on our little uh, triangle here, we could hopefully see pretty easily that A, lowercase a, the real part of our complex number A is simply our magnitude cosine angle theta A and B is a sine theta A. So this allows us to convert from an exponential or polar form to rectangular and we can go the other way by realizing that our magnitude A is the square root of a squared plus b squared from good old Pythagorean theorem. And our angle theta a, uh, we can most commonly express it as the inverse tangent or the arc tangent of the imaginary part b divided by the real part a. And so these are the different equations that we can use to convert uh, back and forth. <laughs> Before we get into um, mathematical operations with complex numbers, I want to define something real quick. And it's what's going to be called the complex conjugate. So the complex conjugate is found by simply taking our imaginary number, excuse me, our complex number and flipping it over the real axis. So, we would take A and we would get something like this, and we're going to call this guy A conjugate. So anytime you see an asterisk like that, uh, when dealing with complex numbers, that does not mean multiplication. Okay, I want to be very, very clear about that. It means to perform the complex conjugate operation, where A conjugate has the same real part, but the negative imaginary part. So we could say a complex conjugate is simply a minus jb in rectangular form. And we can see that when we flip our angle over the real axis, this is going to give us an angle of negative theta a. So the complex conjugate in exponential form is a e to the minus j theta a and in polar form it's simply a angle negative theta a. So that's our complex conjugate operation and that's going to be extraordinarily important. We're going to use that often um, especially in our power analysis portion of our upcoming topics. Uh, all right. So now let's talk about mathematical relationships or mathematical operations actually would be better. And we're going to start by defining a complex number. A is A plus JB or alternatively a e to the j theta a or alternatively a angle theta a and we'll have a complex number b which will be c plus j d or b e to the j theta b or a or excuse me b angle theta b. <clears throat> so if we want to do addition, um, it's not impossible to work 
and polar or exponential form, but it's much, much more simple to work in rectangular form. So if I wanted to do the operation of A plus B, that would simply be A plus, plus AB plus C plus JD, which would give us A plus C as the real part, plus J, B plus D as our imaginary part. So adding complex numbers is very similar to say like adding a vector, adding vectors in a physics class. Um, you add the real parts together, you add the imaginary parts together and you form a new complex number. Just like if you had, um, let's say we had a complex number, um, no, a, a, a vector uh, that was one, zero, two, and we wanted to add to that zero, one, one, we would get one, one, three from our physics class. We're adding the X component, we're adding the Y components, and we're adding the Z components. Well, these complex numbers, we can treat them as two-dimensional vectors, having a real part and an imaginary part, and do uh, addition and subtraction operations in that way. Um, all right, so subtraction is just addition, but there's a negative number mixed in there. Subtract, subtraction. So A minus B is gonna be A plus JB minus C plus JD. And so that's going to give me A minus C plus J. So now I gotta be careful here because I gotta make sure here. So I have a negative sign there. I have a minus J here that I'm factoring out. I have A minus C, and then I have negative B minus D. So I think I'm just, I'm making sure I'm distributing my negative sign correctly here. So from the real parts, I have an A and a negative C. On the imaginary parts, I have a negative B and a negative D. And so that's why this guy is getting a positive sign. Okay, so I just wanted to be clear about that. Uh, multiplication. In rectangular form, uh, it's a bit more tedious, but it's still useful. Um, so for instance, we could have A multiplied by B would be a plus JB times C plus JD is going to give me AC plus JAD plus JBC plus J squared BD. Now, uh, J squared, anybody know what that's going to be? Negative one. Yeah, negative one. So this is going to simplify to AC minus BD plus J AD plus BC. Um, so we need to mention J squared is going to take, uh, is no longer an imaginary number. So we're going to lump that in with our real. Now uh, that's uh, a little bit tedious. If we did that same operation using our exponential form, that would be a e to the j theta a multiplied by b e to the j theta b would just give us the magnitude of a multiplied by the magnitude of b multiplied by e to the j theta a plus theta b. So multiplication in exponential or polar form, you just multiply the magnitudes and add the angles. A lot easier than foiling things out. Uh, division. Uh, 
this is going to look a little bit weird. Um, so A divided by B is the same as A divided by B multiplied by B conjugate divided by B conjugate. Uh, and you may be thinking to yourself, well, gosh, that's an odd operation. Uh, we are just multiplying by a factor of one. But what it does is we had a complex number in our denominator, right? So we, our, our original form would be A plus JB divided by C plus JD, right? So we have a rectangular complex number in the numerator and a rectangular complex number in the denominator. When we multiply by the complex conjugate, which is C minus JD, what happens in the numerator is that we're going to have C squared minus D squared, uh, excuse me, C squared plus D squared. Um, our cross term cancels out. So it's very similar to how if you have like X plus one times X minus one, you have X squared minus one, this is the same thing. You don't have those middle terms as a function of um, x. So then we have our multiplication, which is going to be ac, I'm going to have negative j squared bd. Negative j squared means we're going to have positive bd. And then I'm going to have jbc minus AD. So this is what our division operation looks like in rectangular form. Again, a little gnarly, uh, but if we go into exponential form, we see that it's AE to the J theta A divided by BE to the J theta B is simply the magnitude of A divided by the magnitude of B E to the J theta A minus theta b. So division in polar or exponential form is simply divide the magnitudes and subtract the angles. So it's a little bit better, to, uh, easier to do by hand. Um, and those are all the mathematical operations that we are going to concern ourselves with. Just simple addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. Um, that's, that's the only math that we're going to have to know how to do and, and the complex conjugate. Uh, that's the only mathematical operations we're going to have to know how to do to successfully analyze circuits in the steady state sinusoidal domain. Um, any questions? Hey, Dr. Yep. Hartman. Yes, sir. Uh, did you mean to put uh, that for the subtraction one, you have A minus JB? Did, you meant that as a plus, right? I just realized. Yeah, so that should be plus, so then it would be A minus C. Okay, okay, so that's why I was confusing myself. Thank you, so let's revisit that. So it should definitely be A plus JB because that's how we've defined complex number A. So that's going to give me, so this is plus B minus D. All right, thank you for pointing that out. Any other uh, questions? All right, let's jump into the in-class assignment then. Um, and there's going to be a couple of little topics that I'm going to have to interject in here that we'll see um, fairly quickly, actually, I believe. Uh, so for this first problem, we're asked to express each of the following complex numbers in polar form um, using angle between negative pi and pi or negative 180 and positive 180 degrees. So our first complex number we have A is equal to negative 18.5 minus J 26.1. Uh, so if we want this in polar form, that would be our magnitude would be the square root of negative 18.5 squared plus negative 26.1 squared. And if we do that, 
we get thirty one point nine nine two. Nothing surprising because that's the exact magnitude we get in my answer. However, if we look at our angle, theta A, it is defined to be the inverse tangent of the imaginary part, so negative 26.1 divided by the real part, negative 18.5. If we do that operation, we get 54.671 degrees, um, which is wrong. Let me explain why it's wrong. If we plot our complex number, where this is our real axis, and this is our imaginary axis, then we should see that A, since it has a negative real part and a negative imaginary part, should be somewhere over here, right? Just sketching things out. Um, but an angle of positive 54 degrees would actually be this guy. So what we're seeing is that we're getting the right angle, it just needs to be shifted by 180 degrees. Um, and the reason that is, is because the calculator can't tell the difference between negative 26.1 divided by negative 18.5 and positive 26.1 divided by positive 18.5. So we would have to, in this case, subtract 180 degrees uh, because our constraint is that we want our angle to be between negative 180 and positive 180 degrees. And this would give us negative 125.329 degrees. And if I multiply that by pi over 180, or negative 2.187 radians. So that's something that's very, very tedious. Uh, and if you were doing this by hand, you would have to constantly keep up with. Um, luckily, if you have a TI-36X or a Casio 115 or Casio 991, it can perform these operations uh, for you without making that mistake. Um, so for those of you who have a TI, uh, for um, um, uh, a moment, you guys pay attention and everybody with a Casio can space out for about three or four minutes. Um, so to do complex manipulation on your TI-36s, uh, first thing that you would want to do is go to mode. And if you look down on the mode menu, the fourth um, row, you have the option of, it says real, a plus bi, that means that the, uh, the complex number would be expressed as a rectangular complex number, or r angle theta, meaning the complex numbers will be expressed as polar form complex numbers. Um, so in this case, we want a polar form complex number, so we would choose that r angle theta option. If we get out of our mode menu then, and we hit the second button, and now we hit the pi key. Um, so second pi gives us our complex menu. And so here we can see where our angle operator is. Um, we can return the polar angle of a complex number. We can return the magnitude of a complex number. We can convert a rectangular complex number into polar, or we could convert, uh, number five converts a polar complex number into rectangular. Number six does the conjugate operation. Seven gives us the real part. Eight gives us the imaginary part. So we have all of those mathematical operations built into our calculator. So I can type negative 18.5 minus, 
And if I hit the pi button three times, that gives me my imaginary operator I, 26.1, and hit enter. And it tells me that the answer is 31.991 with an angle of negative 125.329 degrees. The calculator can automatically switch between those two. It just depends on which mode that you tell it to do. So it didn't fall for the fallacy here of taking the inverse tangent and understanding which uh, you know negative over negative is the same as positive over positive. If you use the complex operations on your calculator, it can take care of that for you. Uh, now everybody who has a Casio pay attention and everybody who has a TI can space out for three or four minutes. Uh, here's my Casio, okay. So on a Casio, uh, it's a little bit more difficult to do. And this is the one that I'm also a little bit less familiar with. Um, but I believe if you hit the mode button and then you press the two button, that will enable complex math, okay? Um, if you hit the shift button and then the two button, that will bring up a menu where number one is the argument or the angle. Number two performs the conjugate operation. Number three converts to polar form complex numbers. <coughs> Excuse me. And number four converts to rectangular form complex numbers. And finally, if we hit shift and then the mode button going into setup, and we go down to the second page and press three, there's another complex menu. And that's the one where you choose whether your calculator will split uh, display results in rectangular form or polar form. So I'm gonna choose to have my calculator display the results in polar form. I'm gonna press two in this menu. Um, I can now do negative eight, point five minus 26.1 and the I button when you're in complex mode if you just hit the uh, the ENG button above the eight that's going to give you your imaginary operator um, so it, and on my screen it looks like a negative 18.5 minus 26.1 I hit equal, and I get 31.991 with an angle of negative 125.329 degrees. So um, it would probably be best if you guys familiarize yourself with the calculator operations uh, for the remainder of problem one. So, you know, take a couple of minutes, I guess, to do that while I go get a soda.
All righty. So, um, anybody having trouble with their calculator? I know it might have been odd to follow directions verbally, um, but you know it is what it is. It's what I can do. All right, nobody's saying they're struggling with their calculators, so I'm going to assume that you could easily convert 17.9 minus J 12.2 into this guy, and then negative 21.6 plus J 31.2 into that guy. Um, so let's look, move on to problem number two. Uh, this is the exact same thing, except you're converting a polar form complex number uh, into a rectangular form complex number. Uh, notice that complex number A does not have a degree sign, so that angle 1.9 or negative 1.939 is in radians. Um, so you would have to convert that either, you would have to either use your calculator in radian mode or convert it into degrees by multiplying um, by 180 over pi. And then it's again just simple calculator operations. So I'm going to jump over this one because it's the exact same thing you just did, but in the opposite order. All right. For the last problem, this is where things, uh, this is where having a calculator that can process complex numbers can be so incredibly useful. Uh, so, <clears throat> excuse me, let's talk to the TI guys again for about two or three minutes. Um, so you can store numbers in your calculator um, pretty easily. So for instance, I can type in negative 2 plus 6 and hit pi three times so that I have negative 2 plus 6i. And if I hit the store button that's to the left of the 1 key, I can and then hit the uh, it says X, Y, Z, T, A, B, C, D. That allows me to store up to eight different variables. So I'm going to store negative 2 plus 6i as X. I'm going to store 4 plus 7i <clears throat> as Y. And I'm going to store negative 6 minus 5i as Z. So now, if we look at question A here, we can literally just say x multiplied by, in parentheses, y plus z in our calculators, <coughs> excuse me, and I get 17.888 with an angle of negative 116.565. Now the reason I'm getting a different answer here is because I've asked for the smallest possible positive magnitude, which means I simply add 360 degrees to my angle. And I can achieve that. So I know that my magnitude is 17.888. If I hit second pi and then two, the polar angle of x multiplied by y plus z plus 360 gives me 243.435 degrees. So easy peasy there, right? I can just shift it by um, 360 degrees by just using the angle operation that returns the angle of a complex number. <clears throat> For problem B, since I have all my variables stored, I want the complex conjugate of Y, so I hit second complex and six, and that gives me the conjugate put y, close my parentheses, multiply that by y, multiply it by z, and I get 507.666 with an angle of two, uh, negative 140, so I'll need to shift that one by 360 degrees as well. Uh, but the overwhelming majority of the work was handled by the calculator. <clears throat> For part c, um, if I do one i if I do I by itself, my calculator gives me an error, so I need to give it a magnitude uh, to the seventh power. It gives me a domain error. So that's a little bit of a problem. <clears throat> Excuse me. 
So I'm going to make a table. Hopefully you guys will be able to see what's going on pretty easily here. So I'm going to start somewhere in the middle and I'm going to say that J to the first power is the square root of negative one. So that means that J squared is negative one. We've already established that. What's J cubed? Would it be uh, negative one times the square root of negative one? Exactly right. So negative square root of negative one or negative J, you call it that. Uh, what's J to the fourth power going to be? J squared. J squared times J squared. So negative one squared is? One. Positive one. So it's going to cycle like this. For instance, if we go J to the fifth power, J to the fifth power is J to the fourth, which is one times J to the one. So that J to the fifth is just J. Then J to the sixth is J squared or negative one, et cetera. And if we go the other direction, J to the zero, well, anything to the zero with power is one. J to the negative one <clears throat> is one over J. If we multiply this by J over J, we get J divided by negative one is negative J. J to the minus two, so that's one over J times one over J is one over negative one is negative one. J to the minus three is these two multiplied by each other, so that is positive J or square root of negative one. Um, so it just cycles over and over and over again. So J to the seventh is the exact same thing as J to the three. If we ever have a power that's greater than three, we just subtract uh, four from it over and over and over again until it's within the range of zero to three, and then we're good to go. <clears throat> All right, excuse me. So J to the seventh, we know to be um, the same as negative J. So then that means that for part C, we would just have negative one I times the conjugate of X. So second complex six conjugate of X plus Z 12.369 with an angle of negative 165 and change. And then we would convert our angle to be a positive number. So doing it on the TA calculator, fairly straightforward. Now it's time for the Casio folks. Um, so to store a complex number on a Casio number, or on a Casio calculator, <clears throat> it's a very simple, uh, si uh, similar process. So we would have negative two plus six, and then hit the engineering key to give us I. Hit shift, and then the recall key, which is directly above the number seven. <clears throat> and then we would press one of our letter keys. So um, you can see uh, on the, the row above where the, the recall key is uh, in red, it says A, B, C, D, E, and F as we go across. So if we hit that minus sign key, that's gonna store it as variable A. If we hit the, um, the degree symbol key and the one with the quotation marks, it looks like, um, it gives us B. If we hit the hyperbolic button, it gives us C, sine D, cosine E, tangent F. So let's just store this guy as A. Uh, and then it'll show up and it should say negative two plus six I arrow sine A. And it gave me two angle 10, or excuse me, two times the square root of 10 angle 108 degrees because I have it set to give me my answers in uh, polar form. Um, so we could do a similar thing Let's store complex number y, 4 plus 7i as b, and negative 6 minus 5i 
as C. So uh, Casio doesn't let us use X. Uh, actually, I think there is an X. There's an X and a Y, it looks like, uh, but oh well, I'll just use A, B, and C. Um, so for problem 3A, we would just hit alpha, and we would have A multiplied by alpha B plus alpha C, and it gives us 8 squared of 5. If I hit the Um, S arrow D button, I get 17.888 angle negative 116.565, which is the exact same thing I got on my TI. I could convert that angle um, by, let's see, going to shift two, then I hit one. So that's giving me the argument operation. Uh, argument is the more formal mathematical term to return the angle of a complex number. Um, let's see, alpha A multiplied by alpha B plus alpha C. And then to that I add 360 degrees and I get 243.435 degrees. And you could, uh, instead of doing the math again, you could store um, the result of the first part as a number and just effectively just say the argument of this new complex number I've defined and add uh, 360 degrees of that. Uh, for part B, second two to bring up the complex menu, press two again for the conjugate operation, alpha B multiplied by alpha B multiplied by alpha Z or C, excuse me. I'm going to hit a weird button here. Alpha B times alpha C. There we go. And converting, I get 507.666, angle negative 140. And so, for, so all the same operations are available on the Casio calculators. Um, they're just in a different place than the TIs because different engineers made them. Um, so. Um, I would encourage you guys to use this uh, in-class assignment. Um, you don't really have to show a whole heck of a lot of work or really any work. Um, use it to practice, practice getting familiar with the complex operations on your calculator. Uh, and that's because when I start working out example problems, um, I'm, I'm not going to go through and say, all right, well, I'm adding two com complex numbers together, so I'm going to go ahead and convert both of them to rectangular and then add the real parts and add the imaginary parts because your calculator does not care if it's adding together polar complex numbers and rectangular complex numbers. It only cares about the settings you give it, meaning it's going to output uh, its answer in either rectangular or polar form. So um, I'm not, I'm not going to say it's a waste of time for you to know how to do this stuff by hand. Um, but it's way more important than you can, that you can do it using your calculator uh, efficiently right now. Um, okay, so anybody have any questions about using their calculator or anything uh, pertaining to complex numbers? Yes, sir. Dr. Hardman? Yes. What did you say about, um, for the Casio, you, you were saying something about the argument um, button. How does that work again? So the argument button returns the angle of the complex number. Okay, and you have to like enter in because it opens up like a parenthesis. So do you like type something in in particular or? Yeah, so, so for instance, uh, for, so for what I did, I, let's see, shift to argument, and then I had to put in my expression again. So X, which I stored as variable A, so alpha A, multiplied by open parentheses alpha b plus alpha c close parentheses close parentheses that's going to give me the angle of that mathematical uh, the the angular portion of that mathematical operation and then to that i add 360 to give me that but i could have done so i can say that X multiplied by Y plus Z, I could store that as say variable D. So alpha A 
multiplied by open parentheses alpha b plus alpha c close parentheses shift recall and then press the sign key and it's going to store that number as d and now i can go shift to argument of alpha d and it's just going to give me the angle so i don't have to do the math again inside that uh, argument expression all right thank you so much yeah and um there's going to be a point in uh let's see probably either thursday or next monday where we're going to be using nodal analysis and mesh analysis to answer some problems and your calculators um the, the casio actually none of these calculators just just to be clear uh, none of these calculators are capable of solving a system of equations <clears throat> that use complex numbers. Um, so what that means for your exam, um, now we could do it by hand by Kramer's rule and I'm happy to show you guys how to do that. Um, but on your exam, I will never give you a problem that is required to be solved by setting up a system of equations. So you guys are also gonna get a whole heck of a lot of practice on um, using tools like current division, source transformation, voltage division, things like that, um, maybe even superposition, uh, again, to be able to analyze circuits without setting up a system of equations. But uh, for your homeworks and stuff, <clears throat> you can use MathCAD, and MathCAD has no problems whatsoever about setting up or solving systems of equations with complex numbers. And in fact, that argument operation that we're doing on the Casio calculators, that is exactly what you type into MathCAD for it to return the uh, angle of a complex number as well. So, so if you guys want to start uh, messing around with MathCAD, um, you can just to try to feel out how it's going to process complex numbers and things like that. I would highly encourage it. Um, if for whatever reason you do not have MathCAD, let me know and I will send you the form that needs to be filled out so that you can get access to the latest version of MathCAD. Um, and actually, even if you do have MathCAD, you probably are going to want to download it because we just, I think last week, went from MathCAD Prime 5 to MathCAD Prime 6. So uh, sooner rather than later, we're going to be making all of you guys upgrade anyway. So might as well do it now. All right, uh, any other questions? Uh, yeah, on the homework um, for number one, it's got for part D, it's B, X, R, E, in parentheses, then A. All right, for the, um, the second to log into WebWork. Actually, okay. uh, let me log into WebWork on this computer. That makes sense so that you guys can see. Web work. 221. All right, so let me switch over to sharing web work. Um, I believe you were referring to homework 18. Yes, sir. Problem one. Yeah, I just right. didn't know that Ari was referring to on part D. Okay, so that's the real part of A. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's all that means. And your calculator can do that too, as it turns out. Um, so if we looked, um, at part D here, uh, how I would approach this problem as I would store these variables. So negative four plus five I, I'll store as A. Eight plus five I, I'll store as B. And negative five plus five I, I'll store as C. I'm using the exact same letters as a homework problem, so I can't make any simple mistakes. Uh, so for part D, particu uh, in particular, I would do uh, B plus, and then I'd go into my complex menu. So on the TI, the real uh, you get by going into second pi and then hitting seven. So the real part of A. 
and for those of you with Casio, you get their shift two. Hmm. I could have sworn you could do it on a Casio. Are you looking for the real part on a Casio? Yes, please. You just hit option directly under shift. Or at least that's how it is on mine. Um, do you have a 115 or a 991? I have a 991 EX. Okay, yeah. There's there's a, there's a way to do it on the, the 115s as well. I, I have a 115, not a 991. Mm -hmm. um, okay, my wife just texted me that she wants snow cones. Um, I'll have to look at my manual to figure it out, but I know for sure that there's a way to just get the real part of the complex number uh, on the Casio FX 115s as well. I just can't remember what it is off the top of my head. But you can just look and multiply by that real part without yeah, having yeah. the operator. Yeah, so like that would be D times negative four plus A times positive eight. So it's not particularly hard even if you can't find the button on your calculator. Mm -hmm. I just like to use my calculator for everything because I'm lazy. Um, so, you know, it is what it is. But yeah, so this, uh, that, that's just uh, asking you to get the real numbers. For part C, um, if you're using your calculators, you're going to have to make sure J to the fifth is the same thing as just J. So you would, you know, convert that down. Uh, let's look at problem two and see if there's anything wonky there. Uh, not particularly. Lots of conjugate operations in part A to pay attention to. Um, so again, none of those asterisks are multiplication. They are all conjugates. Um, part three, comp, uh, numbers in exponential form using an angle lying in the range of negative 180 to positive 180 degrees. So that is almost exactly the exact same thing we did on the in-class assignment problem one. And then problem four is converting from polar form to rectangular form. So that's effectively in class assignment problem two. And then uh, problem five here is just doing some basic mathematical operations. Um, so we can see here on the first one, we have real numbers, which can be thought of as rectangular numbers with a complex or imaginary part of zero um, being mathematically manipulated alongside of uh, polar form complex numbers, which again, your calculator can handle literally all of this, doing it by hand. Um, it's tedious and it's great, but I mean, calculators are there for a reason. So I would use this homework set as well to practice um, using the calculators. Alrighty, any other questions regarding any of this uh, complex number jibber jabber? Alrighty, well, I will get um, the videos up for lecture 18. So you, I don't think I talked about anything different in, in this, but if you want to rewatch it, go nuts. Um, and then for lecture 19, which I believe is going to be a two part lecture. Uh, so it's two videos. One is on a review of sinusoids. Uh, and the overwhelming majority of homework set 19 is based on that review of sinusoids. And I'm going to, I'm not going to lie, it's a lot of math. It's ugly, um, but it's building up to getting to use complex numbers um, to analyze circuits. So it's kind of necessary that we go through and make sure we understand what we're doing and why we're doing it. Um, and then uh, I think the second part is getting into um, introduction to steady state sinusoidal circuits, maybe all the way up to introducing uh, what's called phasor domain relationships, which is where we really get into the meat and potatoes of using complex numbers to analyze circuits. Uh, so um, I would watch, uh, at a minimum, try to make sure that you watch the, um, the sinusoidal review part tomorrow, um, because if not, you're just going to be totally lost, to put it bluntly. So try to avoid that. All right, I'll catch you guys uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, sir, I have a question. Yes. 
Um, I forgot, like I saw your email too late about submitting for the exam too. Is it possible to resubmit the um, scratch paper stuff? I took the email that you said, so I just download all of that and put it in a folder. And so since mm -hmm. he's to me and an email, I just put it in the folder. Okay, thank you. Yeah, so that, that's, you're good. Any other questions? Alrighty, catch you guys tomorrow morning. Have a good one. You too.